Right, so good morning, everybody. So um, um, in the Met Office, we literally sit in the middle. We sit between the scientists, so uh, the likes of Lucy, and the users, which you'll be hearing from um, after me. So really what I wanted to cover in my talk is really um, what the UK has done to prepare itself for space weather and how it's gone through that process. So really, UK's interest goes back to um, 2010 and, and, and 2011. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's quite unusual that as a risk, it's gone on the UK's National Risk Register uh, before we've had a major event in recent history, essentially. Um, so quite a few things came together at, at a similar time. Um, the solar maximum and politicians got, um, unfortunately, quite um, fixated on solar maximum, but think we, we, we shouldn't do so. So that was due to occur around the 2012 Olympics, and we've heard about some of the impacts Lucy talked about. There's concern about uh, a big event occurring during the Olympics. Um, the 2010 Icelandic volcanic eruption, you'll say, what's that got to do with space weather? Well, what that showed us is that um, up until that point, National Risk Register really only had risks which a small group of people thought were of concern. The scientific community knew that an Icelandic volcanic eruption could have a big impact on the UK. So what it forced the government to do was to look more scientifically at the risks that might affect the UK. And space weather was one of those risks they looked at. So um, in 2011, space weather went on the UK's National Risk Register as a medium high risk. Um, and, and it still sits there today. So here's a, here's a schematic of the National Risk Register, a bit easier to read than the, than the one that's actually published. And you see space weather sitting there sort of on the right hand side. So the really bad stuff is top right, and the not quite so bad stuff is, is bottom left. So the vertical axis is showing the impact, and horizontal axis, uh, axis is showing you the um, likelihood. Yeah, so we've got pandemic flu really as being the standout risk, but um, space weather then sits the cluster just, just, just around that. So it is considered by the UK as being a very high risk. So just put it in context, you see there volcanic ash back to 2010 disruption it caused, that has, is anticipated to have a lower impact than a major space weather event. So a lot of the evidence we use to drive this, and the metal is, is the risk owner on behalf of the UK government. So in terms of the input to the National Risk Register, the metal is responsible for that, and we act as the technical experts to government and government stakeholders. So um, around the time um, that Space Weather went on the National Risk Register, uh, the Royal Academy of Engineering was commissioned to do a, a review of what the likely impacts of, a, of an extreme space weather event would have on UK engineered infrastructure. Um, you can Google it. I'm not going to go through the detail. It's an easily accessible report, uh, and it talks through the potential impacts you'll, you'll see. And really the standout risk is uh, and really what probably gives it has given it the political headlines is probably the electricity risk. I'm sure Andrew will cover that in his talk later. But as we've already seen from Lucy, quite wide-ranging. And I think as we look at some, uh, some other impacts, I actually think um, electricity probably isn't the standout risk. It's perhaps the one with the highest political profile, but perhaps isn't the risk we need to be most concerned about. Now, the UK government has referenced space weather in a number of documents. Um, here is a couple. So the, um, the, def the Security and Defence Review, and National um, Security Strategy for Strategic Defence and Security Review 2015, and the National S uh, Space Policy. Um, so both these specifically mention space weather. And then any time now, sometime over the summer, we're expecting a defence space strategy to be published and the sort of trailers we've seen of that clearly uh, talk about um, disruption to space-based activity, not just from man-made causes, but from natural causes as well. If you look at natural causes, you're talking really about near-Earth objects and space weather, and, and space weather occurs much more frequently. So we're expecting to see more references to, to space weather in future government policy documents. So a result of that activity in 2010, then MOSWAC, the Met Office Space Weather Operations Center, was created in the Met Office. Um, so it's fully integrated with our normal Met Office operations. 
We're one of only three centres globally which is manned 24-7 by space weather, expert space weather forecasters. There are many, if, you go, if you go and Google space weather forecasts, you'll find many, many centres around the world that produce space weather forecasts. Most of those are automated. Uh, I'll say a bit about that in a short while. Interestingly, the other two centres which are manned 24-7 are both in the US. We've got the NOAA Space Weather Prediction Centre and the United States Air Force 557 weather wing. So we've got about 14 trained forecasters, always have a dedicated space weather forecaster on shift, backed up by somebody else who's on shift who's trained in space weather forecasting. And then we've got all the necessary activity to support their work and, and bring capability through. So you see there the image, you know, you'll see lots of the different views of the sun that Lucy showed earlier, which our forecasters are constantly monitoring. So we have um, impact tables, um, so um, the, the US, as they're very good at, creating these five level um, sort of severity scales. We have the same space weather for the, 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 the NOAA scales. Um, but the language in them in terms of the impacts were very related to the US. So what we've done is we've taken those same scales so we can talk in the same language as our US colleagues. But what we've done is, um, so here on the right-hand side is what the US language is, on the left-hand side is the UK language. You know, we've used uh, dialogue with experts and things like the Royal Academy report to look at what the impact would be on the UK. And perhaps the most notable difference is for the geomagnetic storms, the thing that give rise to risk to the power grid, it's here at G4. So in, in the US they're talking about um, widespread voltage control problems, protective systems, mistakenly tripping out key assets. Um, so this is for exactly the same level of space weather activity. In the UK, we say no significant impact. And that's because people like National Grid and Andrew have done analysis on their network and we've assessed and the vulnerability has been properly assessed. So we produce lots of bulletins at the Met Obvious. This is an example of one of the technical forecasts we produce twice a day. And Andrew and Ewan are, are both recipients of this. Um, Space weather forecasting isn't like terrestrial weather forecasting. You know, I can't tell you that an event is going to happen on the sun, say, in the next 15 minutes, like I'm trying to say, perhaps you're going to get wet in the next 15 minutes. So we're not at the, not at the moment, that's, that's not the forecast. But you know, we cannot predict events happening on the sun. We have to react to events occurring on the sun. Um, we essentially start every shift by analyzing the sun. That's how weather forecasting used to be done when I started in the Met Office 36 odd years ago. First thing you did was an analysis, and from your analysis, you um, start to evolve your forecast. We stand here today, uh, terrestrial weather forecasting is probably 75% machine, 25% human input. Space weather forecasting is completely the opposite way around. It's about 25% machine and model, 75% forecaster. So our forecast will sit down and generate the solar analysis first thing in the morning. And there you see a blow up of a, sun, of a sunspot. The top strip is that um, optical image that Lucy showed us earlier. And the bottom one is looking at the magnetic field. So we can look at where we've got different magnetic polarities generating this energy, potential energy, which is ready to, to erupt from the sun. Our, our forecast will analyze all those using objective tools, look at the probability of different size flares occurring. Um, so M is just for an M class flare, moderate class flare, X is for an X class, an extreme class flare. So look at each of the sunspots and sum it all and see it gets summed there at being 28% for M class and 1% for X. But our forecaster chose to actually ignore that and actually issue a 5% probability of an M class flare and a 1% probability of an X class. So the question is, yeah, do our forecasts add value? And that's something we've been looking at as Sorry. So it goes into a, a table like this, which go into many of our many of our forecast products. So the question is, do our forecasts add value? Get there eventually. So on the left there, you've got the objective system. So you've got the observed frequency of an event, and on the bottom you've got the um, forecast um, frequency of an event. And a perfect forecast should lie along that diagonal line. So you see the objective system is actually over-forecasting those events. 
what I forecast is actually the issue is on the right, and you see it's much closer to that 45 degree line. So we can actually see our forecast are adding value to that objective technique. Yeah, so those corrections they're making on average are improving the forecast. Um, yeah. And that's really key. As I said, you can go and find many, many forecasts around the world which are automated. But I genuinely believe you need that human input to get the best possible forecast, and that's what we do in Methodist. We've produced web pages for uh, some of our key stakeholders. There's an entry page, and there's a page we have for the electricity sector. So <coughs> I'll have a dialogue with Andrew and his colleagues and say, you know, the idea is it's a one-stop shop. We put the page of information, what would you like to see on there? And we put that information on there. Models, forecasts generated, input, um, data plots, uh, whatever we've got, we can put it there. If a situation gets severe enough, then we have very specific briefings which um, are event-based and go out to a whole range of stakeholders. Um, <coughs> yeah, um, we in the Met Office act as the um, holder, if you like, the, 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 the media line with, with, with the press. Whilst it's a forecasting issue, we will try and control the message and make sure it is a considered and, a, and authoritative message. Once we start seeing impacts occur, then we start passing over to the departments who are responsible. So bays in, in the likes of, uh, of, of energy and also spacecraft actually. Um, so they will start talking about the impact, but whilst it's a forecasting issue, we'll try and hold, hold the line. And through um, a, a lot of work, we already understand what the UK response would be to a significant event and how, how all the various bits fit together. So major events in the UK, we have this concept of the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies. You see there uh, that, that, that box on the left. We already essentially have a pre-formed group uh, which would immediately become, become a SAGE and provide advice to the government chief scientific advisor, which then gets put into favor. So we've thought through how we'll respond to a big event before it actually happens. <laughs> Quite unlike many other events is something happens and then we think about how we're going to deal with it. So I'm going to talk about location satellites in a slightly different, spacecraft in a slightly different way, what Lucy did. So here's a very simple schematic of where they all are. Sun's obviously the big thing, Earth on the right, so we have a number of spacecraft in um, geostationary orbit, SDO, Solar Dynamics Observatory, as Lucy's mentioned. We have the American GOES weather platforms carry instrumentation as well. So the GOES instruments really are the only operational satellites we have. Everything else is either science or, 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 or quasi-science operation. Um, at the Grange 1 point, which is about a million miles above the Earth's surface, um, very simply, it's where the sun's gravity equals the Earth's gravity, so you can park a satellite there without using a lot of fuel. Uh, we have uh, essentially three spacecraft there. We've got Discover, which is um, in situ monitoring of the side of wind. We've got SOHO, which takes um, what we call chronograph images, Lucy so some of those with the energetic particles hitting the, the sensors, where we see the coronal mass ejection come off the sun. So those are key satellites, and we cannot do without those. Um, and, and we've actually got ACE, which was replaced by Discover, although interestingly, ACE is more reliable than Discover, but, but that's another story. What we also have, have been using a, a lot is the uh, stereo missions. Lucy showed some images from that. that have been very slowly traversing around the sun, the same distance from the sun as the Earth, um, providing side-on views of that sun-Earth line, but also um, being able to view parts of the sun we can't see from the Earth. Um, so they're approximately there at the moment. So the order of about 120 degrees separation from each other and from ourselves. Um, Stereo B, unfortunately, is probably lost cause. We lost communications with it about three years ago and haven't been able to recontact it. But Stereo A is still a good workhorse and we use that operation every day. So combining views of those coronal mass ejections that Lucy shows, we put into models like this. Um, so at the center of that disk, you've got the sun. That green dot on, on, on the right of the circle is the Earth. And you see the spirals, the solar winds there all the time. And then in a second, it will restart again. We'll see these explosive CMEs go up. So there's one, there's another, and there's a third faster one. So we use this model to predict the arrival time at Earth for these CMEs. So they can take up to five days, in which case we're not really concerned about them. 
they can be very quick. Um, anything sort of 24 hours or less, I would be really concerned about. That certainly is a speed at which, if it's earth erected, the forecasters will get me out of bed in the middle of the night and would be probably in direct contact with National Grid because it's the faster events which uh, are potentially going to cause the biggest impact to the earth environment. The Carrington event of 1859, the largest event we have in history, uh, the chronomass ejection from that did a sun to earth distance of 93 million miles in 19 hours. We've seen them as fast as 15 hours. Um, um, essentially, the faster they are, the more you worry about them as a water sun. Um, this solar cycle has been extremely quiet. We have had a few interesting events. This was um, July 2012. You know, I mentioned the government concern about the Olympics. Here we had an event which was potentially a Carrington class event. So again, we've got the, it uses the same model, but it's just a, a, a different plot. It's a plot from NASA, actually. So in the center, we've got the sun. That yellowish dot to the right of the sun is the Earth. And then we've got this massive chronomass ejection actually goes out, effectively, towards the top left and passes over one of the stereo missions. So we've actually got, so that's a space weather um, spacecraft, so we've actually got measurements of that. Of, of chronomass ejection, and that probably was a Carrington class event. Ten days beforehand, that source, that CME, was pointing at the Earth. Why did it choose that time to release that massive CME? I can't answer that. I don't think any of us really can. Um, if it had been released ten days earlier, you know, most of the conversation I've been having for the last sort of three or four years would have been very different because we would have, we would have had a significant event. Um, I'd have been on the phone probably an awful lot to Andrew and Ewan, and they'd have been very busy people uh, just trying to keep critical national infrastructure in the UK working. So we are reliant on images like this. This is an image from September last year. Um, let's say it's been an extremely quiet set of cycle, an 11 year set of cycle. September, actually, when we were into the declining phase, the set of cycle would be very quickly heading towards solar minimum was the largest event of the current solar cycle. So there on this chronograph image we see that we say again that CME coming off. Part of it was earth erected. Wasn't one we were particularly concerned about. We also see energetic particles ticking away. So yeah, that's what that's what it's doing. Really the mainstay of our forecasting uh, for the most damaging effects of the CME are these chronograph images. But, uh, and Lucy's already trailed this. If we don't do anything, we will lose those. So Soho, the one on the left, which is one sat on the Sun Earth line, that mission is what, 22, 23 years old? You know, spacecraft typically don't last more than 15 years. It's normally designed to last a 10 year life. It is hanging on by a shoestring. The Americans have some plans to replace it, but it's not going to be there until probably 2023, 2024. You know, it is a bit like that hoping that it survives because by 2023, 2024, we'll be well into um, heading towards solar, the next set of maximums, we'll be well into the next period of activity. And the image on the movie on the right, which seems to have stopped running, so I'll get going again. No, it's not going to go. It's from the stereo mission I showed you. We need those two views to be able to accurately triangulate the speed and position of these CMEs. So yeah, a five-day arrival is very different to a 24-day arrival. So again, speed bike, we need both views. If we do nothing, we'll lose them. So as Lucy said, you know, from a UK perspective and from a European perspective, we're really working on this mission to the Grand 5 position, which gives us that side-on view. So, so there's an artist's impression of what it might look looks like. So you see the sun there and the impression of seeing me heading towards the Earth. So it has that side-on view to enable us to help address the speed. And here's a different view of a heliospheric image. It's actually taken from the other side of the sun. So you can see the sun there. We've got the Earth on the left. And then you see this material heading across towards the Earth. I would love to have that type of imagery in real time. At the moment, I can see a CME for the first few hours of its journey. And then I don't know anything about it until it reaches the Grand One point, maybe a day, two, three, four days later. You know, you're, you're sat there hoping you've got your forecast somewhere near right. But with um, um, imagery like this, we'll be able, to, um, be able to track it to a certain degree through that interplanetary space over that 92 million mile journey. It's, it's so 
I thank very much.